Santa Catalina, commonly known as St. Catherine's Island, is a formidable, extraordinary place. It is difficult to reach, teeming with flying sand gnats whose bites will give you welts, oh, and then a few gators. Its interior is private and can only be accessed by permission. Owned by the St. Catherine's Foundation, it is virtually uninhabited except for scientists, all but two itinerant. The island serves as a type of Noah's Ark where breeding colonies can be established to build up numbers of rare animals, which are then returned to zoos or the wild. Currently, a colony of ring-tailed lemurs are in residence. Scientists arrive primarily from the American Museum of Natural History, and they study its extraordinary history of 5,000 years. Modern St. Catherine's Island, one of the Golden Isles off Georgia, was born about 3000 BC when environmental conditions evolved to the point that the island became one of the most resource-rich barrier islands in the world. Its salt marshes and estuaries front one of the world's richest environments, several times more productive than America's most fertile farmland. Accordingly, St. Catharines was inhabited for over 5,000 years by indigenous peoples. The discovery in 1981 by David Hurst Thomas and his associates and the subsequent archaeological documentation of La Misión de Santa Catalina, the long-lost Franciscan mission on St. Catherine's Island off the coast of Georgia, is a moving and significant story. In the late 16th century, this resource-rich island became the northern outpost on the eastern seaboard of the Spanish Empire. It was also the first Franciscan mission on the east coast of what is now the United States. In 1607, Jamestown of Captain John Smith and Pocahontas fame was founded. But four decades earlier, St. Augustine was founded on September 8, 1565, by Spanish Admiral and Florida's first governor, Pedro Menendez de Aviles. Santa Catalina de Huale was probably visited in 1566, a year after St. Augustine, by the Admiral. By 1575, it had become a Franciscan mission. Santa Catalina was a well-recognized saint by the first Franciscans in America. There is another Santa Catalina, also an island, but off the coast of California, close to the missions San Juan Capistrano and San Luis Rey de Francia. The Franciscan period was notably benign, and the friars have been described as a sort of colonial era version of the modern U.S. Peace Corps, seeking and gaining voluntary admittance in Native American societies with the express purpose of disseminating, teaching, and exemplifying what they offered as a better way of life within the context of the new colonial world. St. Catharines was invaded and destroyed in 1680. Ever since, for over 300 years, people have been searching for it. Two 
years out of graduate school and working at his first postdoctoral professional job at the American Museum of Natural History, David Hurst Thomas was the one who fortunately discovered Santa Catalina in 1981. Our archaeologist realized its huge significance and he hasn't let it go. Together with other important projects, particularly Gate Cliff Shelter Nevada, David has worked on its documentation and excavation for four decades now. What follows is the story of how David and his colleagues discovered and have been carefully documenting and compassionately excavating Santa Catalina de Huale for four decades through today. I first came to St. Catharines Island when I was two years out of graduate school. I lucked into a great job at the American Museum of Natural History, biggest natural history museum in the world, and what they told me my job assignment was is to go be the best archaeologist you can be. I worked in the West, in the desert, in the mountains. I still do. But when I came to St. Catharines and had an opportunity to understand that there is an untold Franciscan, Native American story here that played out for 120 years, much older than Jamestown, much older than what America calls its real history. This, this is some, an untold and an unwritten chapter in the American narrative, and it's going to have to be told from the ground up. We, have to, we don't have the historical documents that you have in the Southwest or in California because most of them were destroyed in the process. This climate is not favorable to standing structures. There's no place in the Deep South that you can walk up and put your hand on the 16th or 17th century Mission Hispanic period. It's all erased, except it's still there. It's under the ground. It's, it, you go 14 inches down, and it's preserved if you can find it. So when I came to St. Catharines and found out there was a thriving Franciscan mission here. In fact, for a hundred years, it was the northern outpost along the eastern seaboard. It's as far north as Spain got. And it actually articulated as Jamestown's founded in 1607, Charleston's founded in 1670. These are the two frontiers that are colliding here. So at 1680, when the mission was destroyed on St. Catharines, there's one sighting of it from 1687, and it is just gone. And people have been looking for the long-lost Mission Santa Catalina for 300 years, and I was the guy who was lucky enough to get to find it. Archaeologists, a lot of them don't like to admit this, but what we really do best is find stuff. Uh, we have a different way of looking at it. When I didn't go to medical school, my mother was crushed. She thought I wanted to be a real doctor. And I decided to become an archaeologist instead, and she didn't get it until she lost her watch in a mall in Dallas, Texas. And my little brother and sister were there, and I showed them, we're going to do a systematic survey throughout the parking lot, and we're going to find what Mom just lost, and we did. That's what I learned when I was working out in the desert, where you can have a 10,000-year-old Folsom Point next to a Budweiser can, and they're both dropped right where they were dropped, and they're still there. And so a lot of what I, my schooling, was in statistical theory, sampling theory, political polls, ecology, how you go out and sample something to understand the population. So when we came to St. Catharines, the vegetation is daunting, and I hadn't seen a lot of chiggers or alligators uh, and the rest of it either coming from the West, but particularly you can't see things on the ground anymore, the way I was accustomed to doing it in the desert. So if we're going to go out and find this lost Spanish mission, we have to find a way to interrogate the landscape in a way, if the mission's still there, we've got to figure out a way to start with a very broad picture and narrow it down smaller and smaller and smaller. So we took a space that's 14 miles by 4 miles, took a 20% random sample of that, and you can do that in archaeology. You randomize it the same way you randomize a political survey. 
And we went from 14 by four miles to an area that comes down to about 25 football fields. Somewhere, if it hasn't eroded into the marsh, this is where that mission is. So we changed our techniques and narrowed it down by looking differently below the ground. Some of it using geophysics and remote sensing, some of it doing sampling and test pits. We were able to narrow it from 25 football fields down to two and a half football fields. And we changed our technique again and again. And as we telescoped in on it, when we finally dug holes, the very first hole we found was the 16th century mission well. And the second hole we found was the mission kitchen. And the third hole we dug was the church. So we found archeologists knew how to find garbage, but we had to go to other fields who knew how to find things differently where we could find the sacred structures that had been uh, evading us. Archaeologists really do like to find things, and there's something about holding the past in your hands, hands-on history, that attracts us all to the field. But we've gone through a real change in how we perceive our role as scientists and as, as conservationists. The archaeological record is finite. You can only dig a site once. We're one of the few scientists who destroy our own data. So we're going to destroy it very carefully. We're going to cord things. We can reconstruct our sites in the lab, but they don't exist out there anymore. Once we dig it, it's gone. So we've been trying to develop techniques that are non-invasive. And so if we can, we've always joked, archaeologists have, that if we could just take an x-ray of that site, then we could be like a physician, like a surgeon, and go in and instead of just opening up like, like we used to do, I have a knee I blew out a knee playing high school football, and I've got a scar that's 12 inches long because that's the way surgery was done when I was a kid. Then I wrecked another, the other knee running too much. I would show you the scar in the arthroscopic surgery if I could find it. That's what we're doing. Because there are things like CAT scans and MRIs, the medical profession understands that the less invasive the surgery, the better. That's what archaeologists are doing. So... When we started looking for the mission on Santa Catalina, on St. Catharines, we were starting to play with these technologies that allow us to take that x-ray out there before we, look, we actually dig the holes and wreck the site. We've gone through and, and we've learned that there are a number of currencies. The more different ways, the more perspectives, and this is true for archaeology, the more, anyway, the more perspectives you have, the better it is. And you get trapped into a way of thinking or a technology and if we can diversify that some, then it, we're a lot better off, and particularly because we've only got one shot at these sites. So we use, we use ground-penetrating radar. We use uh, soil resistivity. We run currents through the soil and see where the water is. There are all these techniques. When I was coming along, they were considered kind of voodoo. That you're kind of making it up like you're a dowser out there running around to site where the water is with a, with a witching well. Uh, we started playing with that because we're in such an ideal situation on St. Catharines Island where we can take our time, the sites are not going to be destroyed. The, arche the only way sites get destroyed on this place is the archaeologists dig them up unless they erode into the marsh. So we had plenty of time to work with specialists and now it's considered part of our standard toolkit. Geophysics and remote sensing, all my students know how to do it. We train all of our interns. They're all really good at this. So what it means is we're making a lot less impact on the archaeological record. It's going to, we're going to save the past for the future. But it also means that we can learn a lot more from disturbing less. As we work with other communities, and this is, this is part of what we've learned, it's very different than I was trained as an archaeologist. I was, I was trained as a scientist we're going to save the world. Scientists know how to do things, and we might have to run a little roughshod over some people's ideas and this and that, but we have science is going to really be important. This is the Sputnik era. We understand now that science has brought us a lot of good things and a lot of bad things, and we need to work with other communities who have other interests in the past. So when we take the geophysics and go out in Indian country, we get a lot of resistance from tribes about going out and digging up their ancestors, but we're being pushed by, by Native Americans, among others. 
why aren't you developing these non-invasive approaches to the, why can't we preserve these sites and still learn from them? So this technology, we're being pushed in all different directions and it's a good thing. So we have to have special places where we can just kind of take our time and develop it and bring it along and bring other people in to talk to us and educate us and our students. They're so much better technologically than we are. They pick up this right away. So when we have a problem and we're doing we're ground penetrator radar or, some, radar or something, I look for the youngest kid on the dig. They'll figure it out before the rest of us do. As we narrowed down the process looking for Mission Santa Catalina and we finally found the interior part, the church, the, the friary, the, the building that the friars were living in, the kitchen, and the, native, and the Native American community, a thousand people living around this mission, and the sacred precinct in the middle of it, the place where the real mission business takes place, was all biodegradable. Any of us could go out and build that mission. We'd take parts from the marsh and parts from the forest, put the thatch on, the, on it, and it's totally going to disappear. It'll just go back to nature if you leave it alone. But if it burns because it's got clay in it, it creates an archeological residue that even though it's buried under centuries of hurricane debris and the rest of it, it's got a record down there that, that we can find if we're clever enough to do it. As we were looking for the mission and finally found it, I realized it was under the road that we'd been taking to look for the mission. I'd driven over it hundreds of times. But there's something about my profession as an archaeologist that you'd always rather be lucky than good. And what we had here was we weren't bad at what we do, but we were also really lucky. This thing was perfectly preserved down there. We just had to figure out a way to encounter the past without destroying it completely. Every, it's never been plowed. It's one of the few places. Here, this, this island has a 5,000. There have been St. Catherine Islanders living here for 5,000 years. And there's a sort of perception of the past that when it was Native America, they were living in some kind of pristine environment in harmony with nature. That's not true at all. The human beings manage their environment, and they've done it for a long time, certainly for 5,000 years here. So as they, they worked through this process, they created a Spanish mission, there were cornfields, the rest of it. Slavery came in with the British, it drove out the, 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 the Spanish concept, the Hispanic concept of what a town ought to be, and it was taken over as a plantation. And slaves worked the fields here on this island and planted cotton, but for good reasons, they never went back to this Spanish mission. One plow, one planting of cotton would have destroyed half the evidence that we found. But because Spanish and the Native Americans had grown corn for a hundred years, the soil was depleted in this environment. So it was a place that was avoided, not ritually, but it was avoided economically. It didn't make sense to grow cotton or rice over there, so they just left it alone. And just as the Civil War was coming along, the soil had come along well enough to where they were thinking, now let's create a cornfield over here, a cotton field. And then there was no more plantation period after the Civil War, and the site just laid there and grew up, and it was, it was in perfect shape for us to find. We just had to be clever enough to encounter it. I often think about the Franciscans who, who first came to this island uh, in the 1560s, 1570s. And there's a community here, a town, a Wally Indian town of a thousand people. There is one person in charge. It's a hierarchy. Sp the Spaniards had a hierarchy. One person was in charge there too. So the trick was to establish a relationship between the very top people. And once you make those decisions and make those agreements, the trickle-down effect makes things happen. So the conversation was, we want to build a church, and we want to, the Franciscan idea is, we want to save souls, we, want, we have something that we think you need to know, 
What's in it on the Native American side? Well, it turns out the Spanish had a number of things that they could offer as Europeans were coming in and, and the Native Americans were smart enough to look at other communities where disease was taking them out, warfare was taking them out. It might be in our best interest to play along with these newcomers. They might have something that we're interested in. So as they work through this period, let's, let's build a church. Let's make it look the way a church would be recognizable to any, any European coming. This is obviously a Christian church. It's got to look a certain way. It has to have an altar. It has to have a nave. It has to be conspicuous on the landscape. The, the ordinance of the Indies that King Philip II laid out told the story about creating utopia. That basically, if you look at the Latin American plan that you see throughout Central and South America, the town plan around a plaza and where the buildings are situated, it's repeated thousands and thousands of times, but you don't find it in Spain. It's because they were building a utopia and they thought this is how the world should be the new world if we could start over. So they're trying to spread this idea, we would like to have a plaza in the middle of our town here on Santa Catalina. Well, the, the, the Wally Indians who are living here already knew about plazas. They had plazas. Theirs were round. Let's make this one square. Okay. Let's orient it toward the coast. Okay. And let's have a building that we're all going to work on. We're going to show you what it ought to look like, but you ought to use your building techniques because you know how to, how to work the land. You know what the environment is. You know where to find the building materials. There's not a rock on this island. So we can't use something like concrete. We can't pour things. So there was this back and forth. We have an idea, a Franciscan idea about what a church ought to look like. And we're going, and the Native Americans know about buildings and they know how to build things. So let's come together with what this structure is actually going to look like that works for both of us. And that's what we see with the mission. It has the essential elements that are recognized as a Franciscan Christian church all around the world. And yet it has a local character because it's built out of the, they only have to go a hundred yards to find everything they need to build it. And that's a, that's a St. Catherine's Islander perspective that's grown up over thousands of years. So it's the sort of coming together, it's an everyday practical decision-making process. It's not one imperial culture coming in and dominating another. It's, look, we're in this situation and it's a win-win thing for us if we work it right. How are two barefoot friars gonna shove around a thousand Indians, 300 of them are armed warriors? Somehow they've got to get a common language, not only literally a way to communicate, but let's, let's figure out a way where you're getting what you want and we're getting what we want and that went on for 150 years. So it created buildings that we all recognize as Spanish colonial, but they're also very Native American in character. The, the Franciscan Spanish colonial enterprise is very much about building recognizable spaces. And there are lots and lots of rules that, are, that govern this in the ordinances of the Indies. A plaza has to be big enough to hold hundreds of people. And it's got the important buildings, religious on one side and more administrative on the other. It's got to have a town plan. It's got to have streets. It's got to have an organized way of dealing with this space. This is the European Franciscan idea. It tends to be square. It tends to be rectangle. It has corners on it. Most of the Native American architecture that we're seeing is more circular and it just, Sometimes in, in Pueblo society, you do have square buildings and all that sort of thing, but it's sort of a blending in. So as the Franciscans, as architects, come in and say, here's what we have in mind for building this mission. The King Philip II said, don't go into the Indian town and set up shop there. Go someplace else and build a new place and invite them in as willing participants. So if you have a plaza that will have everybody in town can come in. If you have a church, it's got to be enough, a big enough structure to admit everybody that you want to have in there. So if it's going to be, if it's going to be 40 feet by 30 feet wide, it's got to have a roof, it's got to have all of these things, but it's, it's geared to the size of the community that's there. So the first thing that happens, has to have happened, 
let's pick a direction. And in this case, we tend to think, archaeologists tend to think in north-south. Uh, all of our geophysics, all of our excavations are always on north-south. Now we have a little bit of a decision to make here because as you move around the world, the declination is different. So there's a big difference between true north and magnetic north. Some places it's the same thing, but magnetic north changes. We know over the hundreds of years, and actually it's a dating technique. If we can find out when north was at this site, where north was at the time, we know that was 400 years ago, that was 800 years ago, that was 1,000 years ago. It's a way to tell time. But what they decided is it's when they laid out the Spanish mission here on St. Catharines and in a lot of other places, true north doesn't matter at all. Navigators care about true north, but architects care about how it sits on the landscape. So as they looked at the orientation of the island, the orientation of the intercoastal waterway, where all the boat traffic is coming in, the church is an advertisement. You want to see that from a long distance. It's a major statement on the landscape. So what they decided, let's build our church and orient our whole town along the waterway. And as it turns out, that's 45 degrees off of true north. Once they had that angle, everything else followed and they're measuring out distances. But when that disappears, when the mission disappears in 1680 and it's covered over and hurricanes come in and it, there's no reason to orient things along the waterway anymore. And we go back more to a north-south. So as archeologists, we lay out our grids north-south, and it turns out, I keep saying, I'd rather be lucky than good. We lucked out here. You couldn't ask for a better orientation than 45 degrees off of north because that means all of our techniques, all of our geophysics, our ground penetrating radar, our proton magnetometers, our soil resistivity, we run north-south lines, and as it turns out, we discovered that 45 degree angle early on and recognized 45 degrees tells us Franciscan, Spanish, Native American mission. Anything, any blip we saw in our instrument that's 45 degrees, that's 16th and 17th century. And it, it helped us immeasurably in trying to figure out what that site was like down there, even before we encountered it, even before we excavated it. We knew a lot of the shape of it. When we started working at Mission Santa Catalina, we followed the logical procedure. This is a Spanish mission. It's built by Franciscans. There are rules about what a church should look like. And as we started doing the archeology span and encountered this space, a lot of it fit the plan exactly. The altar was in the right place. The front door was in the right place. And as we learn more about Franciscan ideology and what they were trying to get out of the mission, we could recognize there's a gospel side and there's an epistle side, and there are behaviors that are playing out here because it's a Catholic church of a certain time period, and it's a Franciscan church. But we also found that there's a lot of making it up as you go. There's a lot of accommodating because it's not just a European plan. You've got two Europeans and you've got a thousand Native Americans and they're all involved in this same enterprise together. So as we, as we made the discovery, big deal, in, in the 1980s, we just found the mission that everybody had been looking for for 300 years in this part of the world. That's great. And it looks like a church ought to look. And as we worked with the, with the bishop and, and the other knowledgeable with Franciscans, we knew the rules. We knew what we ought to, what it ought to look like. So when the bishop uh, and I, I called him up and I said, "I believe I found something that belongs to you," and he said, "What is it?" And I said, "It's the oldest church in Georgia." He said, "And it's Catholic. It's way before Georgia Colony. We need to understand this." So he laid out his expectations. I want. I said, "I think we're going to find a cemetery beneath the church," and he says, "You're." almost certainly correct. Do we have a problem with that? Are there, are there Native American concerns? This tribe has gone extinct. There are no Native American people, descendants, biological descendants we can talk to about the enterprise, but it is a Catholic church. They're, the culture is still thriving. We've got to, the descendants stakeholding community here has a, has a hold on this still. 
So if we're going to encounter human remains below the floor of the church, first of all, is that an okay thing to do, to excavate it? And the bishop assured me that the souls have departed. We don't have a problem with this at all. We want to do it in a respectful way, but we also want to learn about our common past. So I said, I think we can, we can do that. I think we can do it in a respectful way, and we can, do, we, can, we can share our finds with the Native American community that has survived, although there are no survivors from this church. What should it look like? Well, the Franciscan custom is pretty clear that people are buried in the way of Jesus Christ. They're buried in a, in a simple shroud, in a pauper's grave, and in a church, the feet will be toward the altar and the hands will be crossed on the chest, and that's where the congregation goes in. We found that 431 times. We could see this repetitive behavior, but the bishop was also interested, let me know if you find a priest. And I said, how could I tell? And he says, oh, because the rules are very clear that the priest is going to be buried by the altar and he's going to be facing the other way. His head is going to be toward the altar and his feet are going to be facing the doorway. And I asked him why that was. And he said, because on resurrection day, they're all going to rise up and he is going to be facing his flock and lead them into heaven. Well, we didn't find any Franciscan burials there because we learned later that they'd been all taken down to the friary in St. Augustine. But everything we were seeing fit the Franciscan rules perfectly to that point. We could find the altar, we could find the doorway, we could see the stations of the cross, we think. We can see the burials being conducted over a period of 120 years, exactly by the rules the Franciscan order had laid out. And then we started finding things that reminded us this isn't just a Franciscan community. It's also a Native American community, and St. Catherine's Islanders have been here for 5,000 years. They know this space. It's theirs. And they're dealing with the practical politics of the day, taking advantage of... They've been invaded before by other Native American groups. Here, a group of friars is coming in and suggesting a different way. There's something in it from the Indian side. Yeah, let's go in that direction. We don't have to. We're not forced to. These two barefoot friars are not going to shove us around. But we're going to ask them to be here and to work with us but we also have our own beliefs that we want to carry forward. So we know from our excavations on the island, and we've worked 20 years before we found the church, there are certain beliefs that you can project back into the past. And about 3,000 years ago, the local St. Catherine's indigenous community decided that you really can take it with you. And you do need to take it with you. The, the things that are important in this life, some of them are going to be important in the afterlife. So women are buried with certain things that are important in their lives. Men are buried with things that are important in their lives. Kids are buried in different ways. And so part of the negotiation process between the Franciscans and the Native American community is putting your finger on what are those things that are critical to us that are not negotiable. So things like burial practice, things like what a church generally looks like, are really important. Let's not negotiate that away. What, where are we, can we be flexible? And it turns out that there's a lot of flexibility in the way the graves are done. That as, as we've talked to Franciscans here on the island about this, that death is a stressful thing no matter who you are and when it happens. And the last place you want to make a forceful statement is to tell somebody how to treat their loved one. So within the rules of the Christian Franciscan order, some things are, persist, but there's a Native American element here, and I'm not even sure the friars are present at, at, at a lot of these burials, but the Native American custom, we have been baptized, we are practicing Catholics, and we also have a Native American heritage that we're going to follow out here too. So what we found was a wealth of material in the graveyard that should have just had paupers' burials with a simple shroud and a pin, but we see the Native American part of it, the things they brought with them that were important, the possessions that needed to go into the afterlife. A huge collection of beads, glass beads took on an incredible importance to the hierarchy uh, among the Indian communities, religious medallions, things that uh, an archeologist would call this a great artifact trap. It's a great mine, it's, it's a place where artifacts go in and they don't leave. So when archeologists come along, 
This is exactly what we want to see. Wells and privies are that way too. When things get dropped in there, they don't get retrieved. So there's a playing out of, of both worlds. They're visiting each other's worlds in creating the reality that's, that's 16th and 17th century Franciscan mission life, but it's got this Native American element. And the artifacts we found, religious medallions from the Vatican, uh, crosses, things that were valued as important symbols of the belief systems at the time went in to those graves and they're telling us a huge amount about what life was like. One of the important things when you, when you, find an, when you have an important archeological site, you're trying to understand the behaviors that produced that when people were living there. But you, what you also have to understand are the, the natural processes. What happened to this site after people left? And we know we can reconstruct this with the church on St. Catherine's Island. We can see that the building burned at one point and it fell over and it fell to the east. So that meant that the, the eastern wall of the church fell outside and the western wall fell on top of the cemetery itself. So we decided, because we're concerned about conservation, archeologists being the scientists who destroy their data, let's destroy this as little as possible. Let's excavate the western wall because it's lying inside the church and we wanna see the rest. Let's leave the eastern wall for other generations of scientists who can do it a lot better than we can. So as we systematically looked at the west wall of the church that was lying on the floor of the church, we could see on the very outside, it's whitewashed. This is great, makes sense. You can see this with the tree, trees cleared out a little bit on the intercoastal waterway. It's great advertising. We've got an important structure here and you can see it for a dozen miles in any direction, bright white. Then as you work through the construction of this, all made of local materials, nothing imported, you can find everything you need to build the church uh, in a half an hour. We excavate down through that and the inside wall of the church is face down. So here's a chance, we were hoping maybe the walls are painted, maybe there, there are pictures there, maybe there are decorations there. We've seen that in other missions we've worked on. It turned out these were not. They were whitewashed on the inside as well. But what we found, as you think through what a Franciscan Catholic church looks like, it'll have the 14 stations of the cross. They're very important. They used to be early in church history on the outside. They're inside to remind the congregation of of the message there, seven on each side, and any mission church you go to anywhere, you're gonna see the Stations of the Cross. Sometimes they're paintings, sometimes they're sculptures, but they're reminding you it's part of the story. We found clay faces that you can hold in the, in the palm of your hand. Each one is a sculptured Wally Indian face, and it looks like they're praying or maybe they're singing. It's hard to exactly tell, but they've encapsulated, we think, the Stations of the Cross, which go deep in Franciscan history, deep in, in Christian church history, and they're made Native American. This is a practicing church. They're taking communion. They've been baptized, but they're still Native Americans. They look like Indian people, and they're playing out. This is part of our reality now and it, we're going to do it, but we're gonna do it in our own way. And we found several of these, they're face down. And uh, as I, I, found, I, was, I was doing the excavation on this, and I found one of them, and I walked over to my crew, and I said, I don't want you to say anything. And I showed it to him, and here is this Indian face. And it just, I, each individual crew member, and everybody talks about remembering and seeing that face. That's the thing about being an archaeologist. Uh, you can, and it doesn't matter really what kind of site you're working on. There's a connection, and I talk to my students and interns about this all the time. You're going to be the first person to see that in a thousand years or 500 years or whatever it is. You're going to have a connection with whoever left that there and it doesn't matter whether it's a Catholic connection or a Native American or whatever it is, there's something about that you are involved with that person in a way that is different than any other connection that's there.
it's remarkable how the convergences that this mission experience has has been for so many of us. The the diocese in Savannah announced the cause of the Georgia martyrs in 1982. These are five friars who were killed in 1597 in September, and they are being considered for sainthood by the Vatican as we speak. The same week that that announcement was made by the diocese, by Bishop Lessard, we found the Spanish mission that we'd been looking for for five years, where two of those friars had been martyred. And over the next 20 years, we think we probably found a lot of the archaeological evidence about these two friars being killed. Now, we have the archaeology, we have the historic accounts. There was, there was an account written, this is 1597. There was a history of this written in 1605. So there's a very, all of a sudden this was world news and the book was written about 10 years later. Now we have the archeology span surrounding that event. We also have other historical documents dealing with this that have been translated. Some of them have been found before, some of them are brand new, but we're, we're coming at it from different ways. The Catholic Church, looks at the rebellion, two friars were martyred here, five on the Georgia coast. Are they really saints? Well, there's a process for understanding that, and the church is going through that. There, there will be an examination, the devil's advocate, of looking at what's the other side? What are the miracles? Are they real, or are these something that can be explained by medicine? Then there's the ar archeological facts of this. We can see the place, we can understand something of the way the community was working, the relationships between the friars, and particularly the relationships between the Indians who were living here at the mission and other Native American groups. The third part is new documents are coming up in Seville, Spain, and some of them preserved in Florida. We're working with historians, and all of that is telling us that what we thought about the rebellion was probably wrong. Most of the way we've viewed the past in the Southeast is based on models from the American Southwest. The Pueblo Revolt of 1680, where 22 friars were martyred in just a couple of days, has been taken as a model of there is oppression and there is resistance and there is rebellion, and the Pueblo Revolt is the only successful Native American rebellion it's the first American revolution, if you talk to Pueblo people. We thought that's the way things worked because we just generalize. It's a normative way of thinking. We've learned to take these, these are different kinds of Indian people, and it turns out the Franciscans had a very different strategy here. The Pueblo, the, the Wali Rebellion in 1597, where the two friars were hit, killed in the, in the church that we found, turns out was neither anti-Spanish or anti-Catholic. It was warfare, long-standing enemies of the people of St. Catherine's Islanders came in and the church, sure the church was destroyed, sure two friars were killed, but the Native American dwellings were also destroyed. The entire community was taken out in a long-standing red-on-red violence and competition really trying to curry favor to get the Spaniards to come in and the Franciscans to come to them because they had a good thing going on, St. Catharines, and their rivals were very jealous about it. Now, it's only with the convergence of there's a Franciscan interest in this, there's an archaeological interest in this, and there's a historical document, doc, documents that are being reread with fresh eyes. And as we understand now, we're just really learning about the causes and the results, but rather than the friars being the enemy who were taken out, we're now understanding that's like the Peace Corps. These are cultural brokers. We have seven rebellions around the St. Catharines area. Not one of them is anti-Spanish. Not one of them is anti-Catholic, as far as we understand. What we have is a very fractious time with different European groups coming in. Some are taking slaves, some are going to church, and they're, they're caught up in the product of their times. And we're able, we don't completely understand this yet, but we know a lot more than we knew 10 years ago. And I bet in 10 years from now, we're gonna have a very different story, a lot fuller story as well.
working on the Spanish mission here on St. Catharines has changed a lot of lives. It certainly changed mine. And we've had really hundreds of students come through the process, uh, professional archaeologists, kids just starting out. Some become archaeologists, some become other things. But as we went through the process, it took us five years to find this site. We worked hard at it. Uh, alligators and chiggers and ticks and, and all the rest of it it's, 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 can be a difficult environment. Five years to find it, 20 years to excavate it. We're still working on it now because part of it's eroding away, but it was really a 20-year process and we thought it came to an end and we were concerned because we're in a special place where things are going to be preserved, we can dig too much. We can wreck the site because we're, we're just, in part, we're having too much fun and the science is so good that we can just keep going indefinitely and we just called a halt to it. We've dug enough, we need to stop. We need to save the past for the future. So how do you stop? We found a church, we found a cemetery, we found something that clearly had Native American significance, it also has significance uh, in the modern Franciscan Catholic world. What do we do? So we worked with the bishop and we talked to Franciscans. How do we, how do we get some closure and finish this out in a way that's appropriate. One thing we do is we need to rebury the, the 432 people that we've excavated. They've, we've studied them in labs around the world. They're incredibly important. This is one of the most important cemetery populations that's been excavated in the Americas. We're learning a lot about health and diet and disease, and it's really showing how wrong the histor historical documents were. They're biased. Uh, and this gives us another take on the past, so that's important, but it also has carry over into the present. It's, it's, it, the idea is to take the archaeology and put it in the active voice. Who does it impact? It's not just science, it's also real life. So I talked to the bishop about this, what should we do? And he said, I don't, I don't, not quite sure. I'm not quite sure either, I haven't been in this situation, neither is he. Well, we should, don't you think we ought to rebury people where they were initially buried? And we agreed, yeah, yeah, we should do that. But how exactly do we do that? And I, we were both kind of groping here. We kind of knew where we wanted to go, but neither one of us had found that path yet. And I'd done some traveling. I'd just come back from uh, Hawaii at Pearl Harbor. My dad was at Pearl Harbor and he survived, but it was an important place for me and so I went there as kind of a pilgrimage to something that was important in my family history, and I went to the USS Arizona. And here's a battleship that was, was sunk in, in the invasion of Pearl Harbor. 1,100 people are still inside there. And it's a, the Navy has decided it's so important in the history of the Navy, in the history of the country, in terms of global history, let's keep that ship alive, even though it's still on the bottom at Pearl Harbor, Let's keep it as a commissioned ship because of its symbolic importance to all of us. I told the bishop that story, and, and he knew about that, and said, what if we did the same thing? What if we took this archaeological site, it's, it's, it's been lost for 300 years, but it's more than just an archaeological site, it's a church. What if we reconsecrated that ground? It is, it is sacred ground. And the bishop said, yeah, we should do that. Let's do it. So he, he brought, he and several Franciscans came over and we had a ceremony in May of 1984 where now it is a active commission church in the uh, Diocese of Savannah. That's a good thing. And since then, and ultimately we brought back the 432 people and we buried all of them there. So it still looked like an archeological site. It's like a construction site. We've dug so much and archaeology is really destructive. So I sat down with the superintendent of the island, Rice Hayes, and we talked about this is not going to be a tourist attraction. It's really difficult to get over to St. Catherine's Island. This is a place that is about conservation and about science and about education, but you have to have a stake in that to get over here. Franciscans, Catholics have a stake in it because it's now part of their active history, but what should we do with the space? Well, let's protect it. Let's fill in all of our excavations. That's important. We'd cleared a hectare, two and a half football fields, taken out all the trees so we could see it from a helicopter. And it helped us understand what that archeology span looks like. Let's fill that in. Let's plant it. Let's keep it open 
it, keep it, it's a very special mission space. What do we do about the church? Well, we're going to fill it all in and we're going to fill in the friary and we're going to fill in all the other wells and the buildings to protect what's still there because there's a lot of science. There's a lot of, a lot of architecture that's preserved there. If you just plant a lawn, it looks like a golf course. It's not a golf course. It is a very carefully designed space from three and 400 years ago. How do we recognize, is there anything we ought to be doing? And the superintendent, Royce Hayes, just came up with the idea, we know where every support beam on that church building is. You've dug them, you've exposed them, we know exactly what the different building episodes look like. What if we just planted a tree in each one of those? And I thought, what a weird idea. And then the more I thought about it, that's a great idea. So they went out, the island staff, and gathered palm trees of exactly the same size. And carefully we worked with the archaeologist, uh, planted them in on each of the support beams, and then planted the lawn around it. And when we st stood back, what we've got, it's not exactly a building, it's a bunch of trees. But it's trees that are built in a form that was laid out by friars 400 years ago. It's a living church. It's still a living church. So we don't get many visitors on St. Catharines. The island isn't structured that way. But the number of pictures that have been taken of this living church from helicopters and airplanes, it's, it's a well-known statement on the land. We can see it in aerial photographs. We can see those trees growing exactly the way that church looked. So over the years, it's reconsecrated. If you use your imagination, it does kind of look like a building. You can see, but it's all natural. It's all living there. How does that space get used? We dug, we, Father Conrad Harkins was part of our archeological crew. He was the head of uh, St. Uh, at St. Bonaventure, the head of Franciscan studies. He wanted to know, he wanted to be where two of his brothers had been martyred in 1597. He wanted to be part of the production of knowledge about that site, the same way we take Native Americans and work on sites. They want to be part of the production of knowledge about their own past. So Father Conrad, during the excavation, asked, can I say mass here? And I, and I said, really? at my site? And he says, it's our site. And there hasn't been a mass said here in 300 years. Can I do it? Absolutely. So he, he came and he, he wore his robes and he did the first mass at, for 300 years at Mission Santa Catalina de Wally. We've had several masses since then. Uh, we, we, we just came from one today. Kids grow up on the island. This is part of their past too. Royce has three kids who were all, uh, two of them were born when I was working here. And his oldest daughter was my nanny for a while and there's just quite a family. So the kids come out and dig with us. And it's really, it's frustrating in a way, their eyes are better than ours. And as we're looking through the screens, their faces, because they're short, are right next to the archeology span that we're sorting through. So they usually find the best stuff first. And we're out there working all day and they come in and oh, there's a bead and here's a medallion and, and they can pick it out. So as they grew up, this was part of their past too. The archaeologists working here, the Franciscans coming through, the, the Catholic Church becoming involved again on St. Catherine's Island. So when Elizabeth Royce's oldest daughter was wise enough to marry an archaeologist, when they announced their engagement, the question was, so where do you want to get married? And Elizabeth says, I want to get married in the church that Dave found. So what we did, we'd had a mass. Now we have a, have a wedding. We've had a funeral. 432 people have been reburied there. So in other words, although it had a 300 year period, it was a church. It was buried by hurricanes. It became an archeological site. And now it's a church again. This has been a special couple of days here on St. Catharines because we've gotten to do something that I guess has been important to me for a long time. I'm a professional archeologist, but I have four degrees and all of them are in anthropology. 
which is archaeology is one way we understand about the human condition, but th there are other ways that we do it. We do it through linguistics and, and, and studying cultures. I worked with the world famous Margaret Mead for six years uh, when I first came to the museum. And basically her message was the importance of what we do is we've got to visit other people's worlds and try to understand different ways of looking at things. And as we worked more here on St. Catharines, I realized the importance of visiting other people's worlds around the context of this archaeological site. Now, I'm an archaeologist. I've got students. I've got colleagues. They read about St. Catharines. They read about Mission Santa Catalina de Wally, but it's not the same thing as being there. It's an important, persistent place for us because it tells us, it gives us the material remains to understand past lives. Archaeologists need to see this stuff. I want to share it with not just colleagues that I've known for a long time, but the brand new professors, students still in school. It's an important spot, so I wanted to share it. It's also a Native American place, and although we don't have any direct descendants from the mission community itself, there are plenty of Native American people who care about this part of the past, and I just thought some of them need to be here. We need to spend a little time talking about this, and it's a chance for, for me to show them what we found, and it's a chance to listen uh, about what they think about it. And it's a Franciscan space, and the same is true. We've worked with Franciscans in the past as part of the excavation process, but there are new generations coming along. There are Franciscan traditions that, that are playing out, and if we can make this part of the past, their past, available to them too, it's a chance for us to, to show it off, because who knows what's going to happen. We, we, ha we have an erosion problem that even the archaeological site might disappear. The mission won't disappear, but the physical presence of it might. Let's take this opportunity just to visit each other's worlds, and it's, it means different things to us, and I think we're all a little better off if we can hear some other points of view besides our own. That's something that the mission has really brought to all of us.